All right, welcome back. After your, your test yesterday, how was it? Boy, <laughs> never heard such an emphatic uh, before. Uh, that should that should be pretty indicative of the rest of the tests you'll have in pharmacology in terms of, <laughs> yay. Uh, but in terms of, you know, being able to, again, identify those individual drugs, link them back to a class, and then what do you know about that class, right? How does it actually inform the clinical case it might be. It might be straightforward what causes this or which inhibits this, X, Y, and Z. Um, but hopefully you thought it was fair, at least, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it, was yeah it was fair, right? So again, as long as you knew the stuff. Well, I mean, even if you got less than 100, it could still be fair, right? Yes, sir. No? I was wondering if you could explain the moxie eye uh, drops with the... Because, we, cause like, the big thing that we learned in Austin was, like, pseudomonas. If you think of the contact lens, bacterial... Sure, I remember what the question was. Um, uh, it was something like you you, you have a patient with a conjunctivitis uh -huh. after wearing contacts all the time and sleeping in the contacts all the time. And uh -huh. The only thing we think of is after that is uh, pseudomonas. Mm -hmm. And then the first thing, you, like, and I'm pretty sure the answer is moxifloxacin. Okay. Drops, but... That's the one fluoroquinolone that doesn't. Come okay, up. I see. I see where you're getting at. Yes, yes. Okay, so a question about that did come up, right? right. So, the question is about you know where specifically you're using, right? And w looking at things like systemic use yeah. versus local localized use, right? Yeah. So again, you have to think about the concentrations you're achieving with that, right? We talked about in Optho, we said, that, okay, you know, the fluoroquinolones are certainly going to get pseudomonas. When you systemically, though, it gets a little more dicey, right? So it can depend on the site of the infection. It can depend on um, the penetration to the tissues. It can depend on the actual concentrations you're able to achieve. You know, perhaps if you drove up the concentration of moxifloxacin that you're giving systemically up high enough, yeah, potentially you could probably get pretty good pseudomonal coverage, but I also might be causing a lot of toxicity in the patients. However, when used topically in the eye, you get such high concentrations, you get much better pseudomonal coverage there. So that is something we use pretty commonly in those cases there. And then was there any other options that were like a good fit? No. Probably not, I right? Probably, so. I probably there are no good answers, actually, because I was like scared of the, I was like, well, that's now, the, wait a second. That's you the non-pseudomonas one. Right, but again, you have to think about the context when it's being used systemically versus in those very localized sections. So the the, the initial bugs and drugs section is meant to um, kind of get you acclimated to all the drugs you're going to be seeing kind of moving forward. And then when we get into those individual disease states, whether it's ophthalmology, getting into cardiology, wherever it happens to be, that's where we're applying it much more directly. And so you have to think about some of those clinical exceptions and whatnot. So um, I apologize if you take some umbrage with the question. We can certainly talk more about it later on. Um, but uh, again, I do try to be pretty fair in terms of things where if it looks like um, I taught something poorly and a lot of people were getting it incorrect, um, and we can actually tell that based off of, you guys ever heard of a point by serial before? And I guess it's kind of like a little um, behind the scenes. I can already tell you guys are trying to get me off topic, so I don't want to start the lecture. But um, <laughs> So one of the things we look at is we, we see the breakdown of how, who answers what, right, basically, and then we get this thing called a point by serial, and what it tells us is, if you get a very positive number there, it says that people who did really well on the test, people who scored high, selected this answer. And if it's zero, it means, well, it was just random. Anyone could have picked that answer, whether they performed well or not on the test. And if it's negative, it actually means that people who did well on the test were picking the wrong answer, right? It means the wrong answer is being, or the, the correct answer is not being selected by even people who did really well on the test. If I see a negative number on that, that usually is indicative of I probably either have wrote a bad question or I taught it incorrectly, right? Or you guys are seeing something I didn't. And so I always take those very seriously. I look at those and I try to, I'm usually pretty liberal with my givebacks, but unfortunately for this one, there really wasn't much room for that. So there's no givebacks that were given on that, FYI. Um, and so overall, it looks like a really good test. I think it's pretty pretty standard for kind of what we do, especially for this first one. Um, people are kind of getting acclimated to it, getting used to the type of questions. And it's a totally different beast from CMS, right? Right, farm is just different, right? And again, you guys aren't going to be pharmacists one day, but we try to teach you the things that you need to know in order to make sure you're prescribing appropriately when you're going to be a PA, okay? Um, any other questions I can answer about that? a little too much detail, but in case you're ever curious about how we go through and review that stuff, is we really look at those. I mean, we even went off to a conference for like a weekend for just learning how to write better test questions and how to like really identify and do the stats on them to see like what's a good question, what's a bad question. We really turned a lot of things around um, to write a lot higher quality questions. You may feel like they're really bad quality questions, but objectively, they are great questions, I can tell you. <laughs>
Anywho. Okay, so moving forward, um, let's talk about our hematology drugs, and mainly we're going to focus on our antiplatelet, anticoagulant drugs for this section here, um, mainly because this has a lot to do with cardio, which we're going to get into next, right? So we have uh, four big sections for cardio. We're going to try to cover the first three here for this section of the course, and then um, four is going to be in the third and last section of the class there. Um, this is nice this year because since we pushed off though onto the first test, this got decompressed a little bit, which is good because there's a lot of cardio drugs and so some people uh, have a little bit harder time with this one than they do id vice versa you're going to find you kind of have your own strengths and weaknesses when it comes to some of these different topics here but anywho um we'll cover some more things like erythropoiesis and iron and things like that over in the nephro section next semester so it's not that we forgot about that stuff it's just we're going to talk about it elsewhere where it becomes up uh becomes a little more pertinent there but anyway getting into our anti-platelet drugs what do these drugs do you think stop the platelets from doing what clotting right from forming those little platelet plugs they have there now hemostasis very important right if you didn't have hemo hemostasis right now obviously you'd be in a much worse situation you'd be bleeding out everywhere profusely um but we want to make sure we keep blood in the blood vessels right it's kind of job number one if you have injury you want to be able to clot off quickly and efficiently however what happens if you're clotting too much you're kind of not going to get very good blood flow because you're going to cause occlusions, right? You're going to cause blockages that prevent further blood from getting in there. You can develop PEs, uh, myocardial infarction. You can get uh, strokes. All kinds of things can happen when blood is not flowing appropriately. So it's a very delicate balance. You're going to find there's a lot of different mediators, both procoagulants, anticoagulants, things that stimulate platelets to aggregate, things that inhibit platelets to aggregate. There's going to be a lot of targets that we can use to uh, affect that system to try to make sure that our patients are either clotting when they should be or not clotting when we don't want them to. Okay. So looking at this, and this is like pretty basic stuff you've covered before. Um, we're just trying to reiterate some of the more important salient points when um, the drugs are going to be coming into play and how they're going to individually affect these systems here. So normally what happens when you have a vessel injury... So imagine I took like a little pen knife or something like that and just poked a vessel and got blood spurting out everywhere. You say, well, cover that thing up, right? Uh, get blood everywhere. But first off, what does your body do to try to inhibit further bleeding from occurring? Well, it causes vasospasm, right? What does that do for us? Prevents more blood from flowing to the area, right? So by limiting that, you're going to use things like local meteors, like thromboxane A2. Anyone know where you make thromboxane? What pathway? Yeah, like Cox pathway, right? We already mentioned thromboxanes before when we were talking about the inset. So some of that information you can already see from ENT is going to be carried forward when we're talking about it in terms of platelet aggregation. Um, other things we're going to see, uh, platelet plugs get formed mainly due to things like collagen being exposed in the vessel, things like other mediators being expressed are going to allow for the platelet plug to form. So you're going to find that normally platelets have what kind of shape to them? Kind of globular, kind of not really activated. What happens when they get stimulated? to form a plug. I'm going to look at some pictures. They, they, they basically go into uh, action mode and they, they have all these little podocytes and things sticking out of them. They, they are sticky at that point, which is good because they want to stick together to form that nice platelet plug. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Um, the next thing up though is you need to have fibrin. Fibrin is kind of that spider web that kind of holds everything in place and that's when you have a nice stable clot at that point. And then the question is, well, how do you get rid of that? And that's where things like plasma is going to be really important here. So we have fibrinolysis. You hear of a fibrinolytic, that is going to be something that stimula uh, stimulates that plasma to work in order to clear a clot, right? So if you have someone who comes with a massive PE, you can give something to actually stimulate this process here. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the cardio section uh, in a couple of um, a couple class periods. Anywho, so again, a lot of different pathways are here. Some of these are going to be positive feedback loops because you want to have one factor go back and feed on another in order to help stimulate that further. So you get a very quick clotting sort of uh, mechanism here. Uh, and then some ways we're going to find inhibitors are going to be involved in this as well to, in order to keep that balance in play here. Right. So you're going to see things like serotonin or 5-HT is really important. That's a good abbreviation term. If you ever see 5-HT, it stands for serotonin. Anyone know how you get from 5-HT to serotonin? Stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine. That's, where that, that's what, what serotonin is, the chemical name for it is. But anyway, we're going to see things like serotonin actually will stimulate platelet aggregation. We're going to see things like um, the COX pathway is going to be really important for platelet aggregation in terms of things like process cyclins and thromboxanes. Uh, and then we're going to be looking at our clotting pathway, right? Remember, we have two clotting pathways. Remember, there's an extrinsic and an intrinsic one. They kind of feed into that common pathway. We get to cover that before, probably in physiology at least at some point, right? <laughs> 
I, I taught it before last year, so I'm assuming and Professor and Kaplan. And in Patha, right? So you've already covered it there? Clint Patha. Patha, yes. No. Thank you. Well, uh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you did cover it there as well. So you've already covered it multiple times. Now we're going to see how drugs are going to get involved in terms of trying to help inhibit that system. So, um, again, this is why we repeat things kind of over and over again, because that's the key to adult learning is just to repeat the same things over and over again from different perspectives in order to drive it into your heads that, yes, this stuff's important. What are the facts you need to know, right? So anyway, normally when you have a vessel that is uninjured, that's kind of in the resting state, you find that the endothelial surface is pretty smooth. Things tend to bounce off of it pretty easily. And you also have this glycocolics uh, layer here that allows for, it prevents things from kind of binding to it, things like platelets, right? Um, you also have thrombomodulin here on the surface of the receptors, and they're gonna do things like binding to thrombin. Anyone remember what factor thrombin is? Factor two, right? Factor two is at the very bottom of that common pathway. So it's stimulating that fibrin, that fibrinogen to turn into fibrin, right? I'll show you pictures of those, of those uh, pathways in a moment here. But anyway, it'll actually bind to throm uh, thrombin. It'll also activate this platelet uh, protein C here and will inactivate some several clotting factors. So the vessels are designed naturally to try to inactivate certain clotting factors so you prevent clots from forming when they don't really are, are not really needed there. Another really important enzyme here is going to be called antithrombin-3. This is going to be really important when we're talking about the substance heparin. You guys heard of heparin before? Right, heparin works with antithrombin-3. It kind of accelerates the activity of the enzyme to help inactivate some of these clotting factors here, right? So you'll find that by heparin binding to antithrombin-3, you get like a 100 to 1,000-fold increase in activity of that enzyme. So it's very, very important. And again, this is something you've probably seen if you've had any kind of hospital experience, that we can give this exogenously to help kind of speed this process along as well. So uh, other things we're going to find, you'll see the things like prostacyclin or PGI2 help to inhibit platelet activation. You're going to see things like thromboxane will actually stimulate platelet activation. And so depending on whether we're looking at um, cyclooxygenase 1 or 2, right, remember it's two isoenzymes of that, we'll see it has different effects on the balance here between prostacyclin and thromboxane. Um, plasmin is really important because this helps to digest fibrin and inactivate several clotting factors. So again, by stimulating this process, if we were to give you a drug that stimulated plasma formation, you could actually bust clots, essentially. So if you ever hear a clot buster, that's basically what we're giving. This is kind of like a uh, chemical roto-rooter for your vessels, essentially. And there's a lot of other known factors here that are going to be uh, at play. I'm only kind of mentioning the most common ones that are going to be involved with in terms of medications. Okay, so again, you can imagine here the red blood cells are kind of getting caught up in this fibrin here. I uh, can't really see too much of the platelets, but I'll show you a few seconds what those actually look like. Kind of these little blue guys here are probably the platelets uh, getting involved in the clot. So normally, as I mentioned, the, the vessels, if they're uninjured, are designed to kind of repel away things like platelets and prevent them from binding to it. But what happens if you have an injury here, right? This is when you're going to start to uncover things like collagen. This is where things like von Willebrand's factor are going to start to be expressed here. And it's going to start to activate some of these platelets here. Once that occurs, it's going to start to release other mediators. It's going to help to recruit, uh, recruit more platelets to the site. And you're going to see also at, you have these expression of these receptors here, these 2B3A receptors. These are really important. And they actually allow for the cross-linking of these platelets here. That's why you form a plug is because basically the platelets get more sticky when they have these different mediators coming in to activate them. And they will then bind up to one another and form a plug. However, that plug is not super stable until fibrin comes along, gets activated, and then kind of lays down the cement to really hold everything in place. Again, this is kind of going through that same process here, or talking about the same process. So the collagen being exposed then helps to bind to that von Willebrand factor. This is also where we see thromboxane A2 and then ADP getting released. What is ADP? Adenosine diphosphate, right? It's the same stuff that gets eventually turned into what? ATP, right? So again, this is an important mediator for platelet activation here. And then, as I mentioned, you're going to cause these conformational changes to expose those 2B3A receptors. And this is really important for causing that cross-linking to occur. And you'll see that fibrin is going to be the thing that helps with that cross-linking there. So our fibrinogen is going to bind the 2B3A receptors. It'll cross-link them together. And then you're also going to find some of these PAR1 and PAR4 receptors. Thrombin or factor 2 is really uh, helpful for starting to uh, have these uh, being activated. This will be another site for drug interactions or for drugs to actually come in and, and to prevent the platelets from working. And then we'll see ADP itself specifically can activate these P2Y1 and P2Y12 receptors, which further activates the platelets. Again, it's a cascade. It's meaning to try to uh, encourage its own perpetuation in order to get a lot of platelets all involved at one time to block off that bleeding from occurring any further and then eventually it'll kind of die out and then once the, the vessel's healed then you can get rid of it eventually. So 
This is a good graph kind of showing you the different processes here that help to activate platelets, right? So imagine you have a platelet here, saying the inactivated state, what are some things that can come along and stimulate it? Well, the big ones I want to focus on here are going to be the things that the drugs are going to be interacting with, right? So for instance, here we're going to find um, things like things that can inhibit the activities of ADP. There's going to be a big group of drugs here, things like clopidogrel, or if anyone's ever heard of Plavix before, right? Plavix kind of sounds like platelets, right? That's going to be a big thing here that interacts with ADP. We'll see that thromboxane A2, which we mentioned comes from the COX pathway. So what drug do you think can interact with that? Aspirin, right? It's going to be a really big one that helps to, uh, to affect aspirin. Um, even things like, I'm trying to think of the other big ones we can do. Um, what, do you, what type of patients do you think might have an issue with the serotonin causing problems? Yeah, I think about serotonin. You think about what does it do for your mood? Yeah, it usually makes you happy, right? So I usually see like a plummeting level of serotonin in everyone's resting states. So when they walk in here when I'm about to talk, right? Um, but just wait, 4.30 is going to be here before I know it, and then serotonin surges again. But it can also lead to platelet activation, right? There has been uh, some issues where you can see interactions there. By having uh, someone on an SSRI or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, there are actual issues you can see with clotting potentially. And then we'll see that the 2B3A receptor is going to be another big target here for our drugs to work. If you can block this and you can prevent fibrinogen from actually binding those together, you're going to prevent the platelets from actually forming the plug in the first place, okay? So, and again, imagine here looking at the platelets in their sort of inactivated state. Here you can see they're kind of globular in shape, kind of not really doing much. They're very smooth. They're not going to really bind up to many things. But then when they get activated, they have all these little feet and everything. They kind of stick out and they bind up to one another. Very sticky at this point. So, getting into the medication specifically, we'll talk about aspirin first. And we mentioned aspirin works by doing what? Blocks cyclooxygenase. Does it have a preference for one or two? Nope, it's going to be a non-selective COX inhibitor. And then the other thing is, is this a, a reversible or irreversible inhibitor? Irreversible. irreversible, right? So this is the key differentiator. If you remember talking about this back in ENT, the big differentiator between the NSAIDs and your aspirin is actually going to be the fact that aspirin is the only one that's going to be irreversible. So what does that mean in terms of platelet effects once the aspirin's kind of gone away? still sticks around, right? You're going to see the effect is going to last longer than what the apparent duration of action of the drug is because... What you're going to find is, is that the platelets aren't very good at producing their own new COX enzyme. So once they're inhibited, they can't really do much else about it until you start to produce new platelets. That's really why we end up seeing this prolonged action of aspirin. Even if a patient hasn't taken aspirin in a couple of days, there could still be an increased bleeding risk because they're still inhibiting those platelets from binding there, right? And again, how long does a platelet last? seven to ten days right so there's a rapid recycling of your platelets right over the course of a week or so and so as you produce new platelets you can give more aspirin and we'll inhibit those new platelets and so that's how you can see that by constantly giving it every day you can do things like prevent say like an mi from occurring right in a patient who may be at risk has a lot of atherosclerosis and their risk for clot these are the kind of patients that get benefit from having that prolonged anti-platelet sort of effect from aspirin and this is mainly due to the fact that it's going to be inhibiting thromboxane a2 right this is the big thing to consider here. Now, PGI2 or prostacycline, we said it was actually an antiplatelet sort of thing there. So you think, well, we probably don't want to inhibit this necessarily, but unfortunately, we kind of have to take the good with the bad. Overall, you're going to find that the big effect here predominates is going to be the thromboxane inhibition, where you're going to see the antiplatelet effect. Okay. Now, normally, you're going to see that COX gets maximally inhibited at around 160 milligrams a day. If you try to drive the doses up much higher than this, you end up seeing a balance shift over towards inhibiting that prostacycline, and that kind of limits how well your drugs are going to be working, or your aspirin is going to be working, because then you have uh, more of the proplatelet effect kind of taking over rather than the antiplatelet. But when you're talking about, say, secondary prevention of a heart attack, how much aspirin do you tell a patient to take every day? 81 milligrams, right? What, what's another name for that? The baby aspirin, right? So you're like, why, I'm an adult patient. Why are you giving me a baby dose of a drug? Why is that okay? The irreversible effect, right? All you need is 81 milligrams a day, and you'll get pretty good suppression of those platelets there. Because, again, if you think about the different, um, you know, your different uh, blood cells, you think about platelets, do they have a nucleus? Mm, they don't, right? They kind of they, they lose that once they kind of go from the megakaryocytes and they break off. Um, you're going to find that because of that, they can't produce their own COX enzyme. So for the life of that platelet, as soon as COX is inhibited, it's not going to be able to produce anymore. The antiplatelet effect is going to be uh, predominant. Okay? Make sense? So you can give it 81 milligrams a day. It's going to be enough to prevent those patients from having uh, the proplatelet effect. Okay. So let's look at another pathway here. We talked about aspirin, how that works. And again, what are the big risks of giving aspirin? What do you have to worry about in terms of side effects? Side 
Excessive bleeding, bruising, certainly. We talked about that. What else? Hmm? Ray syndrome in kids, right? So that's something you could see. However, we still use it in kids, right? I mean, we have kids with, uh, say, they have undergone either cardiac transplant or they've undergone open heart surgery. They still need aspirin too, right? Because whenever you have all this new tissue, all this surgery going on here, you know, you want to prevent those platelets from activating, clotting something off. And so we'll still give those kids aspirin, but you have to balance it out, right? Remember, when, did, when were those kids at risk for rays? That had a viral illness, right? You know, so, uh, specifically like, you know, that the chicken pox, that the flu or whatever, that's when you really end up seeing that. So again, it's gotta be a careful balance there. Kids can still get aspirin, it's just not routinely recommended for fever due to a potentially viral illness, right? That's the thing to remember there. What's another big side effect of aspirin you could see? Hmm? Oh, tonight, yeah, you, so you can certainly see that, right? You couldn't hear you at first, I'm sorry. <laughs> Took too much aspirin before I came in. Um, what's the other big chronic thing you can see potentially? Peptic ulcers, right? Remember, when you have things like NSAIDs around, and this is less likely, you're un very unlikely to get this if you have someone who's only taking 81 milligrams of aspirin a day, but certainly if you're taking higher doses chronically, you can see that uh, inhibition of that gastric protective barrier, right, or that nice neutralizing barrier, and that can lead to peptic ulcers. Any NSAID can do this, aspirin will do this as well, okay? Okay, and again, as we mentioned here, when you have the Cox activation, you're going to find that by those membrane phospholipids get liberated from the, the phospholipid bilayer. This turns into arachidonic acid, and this is where cyclooxygenase comes into play here. And we're really trying to work on the inhibiting the thromboxane uh, uh, production here because we know that thromboxane A2 is going to be stimulating platelet aggregation normally. Okay. All right. As I mentioned, this is going to be irreversible inhibitor here. Um, now, I know it's going to be non-selective, so it's going to affect both COX-1 and COX-2. If you remember, we talked about COX-1 and COX-2. One of those is constitutive and one is inducible. You guys remember the difference between the two? What's constitutive? Have I talked about that before? We got new information for you, so this is fantastic. Anytime I teach you something new, it's always a good day. Um, what do you think constitutive means? Part of the system, it's always there, right? So if I say something that's constitutive, you're always expressing it, it's always active. In this case, COX-1 is always going to be active in you because it's a constitutive form of the enzyme. This is also what's responsible for causing things like the, the um, gastric barrier to be protected or to, to form in the stomach. Um, on the other hand, if you have an injury, say you injured, you have a sprained ankle or something like that, um, then you'll find that COX-2 starts to get upregulated. That's called an inducible enzyme because it only gets expressed under certain circumstances, right? You can induce it by causing an injury in the patient or causing inflammation or causing a fever or something like that potentially, right? So that's the difference between the two. When you have a non-selective COX inhibitor, you're gonna find that it works on both of them equally, okay? Now, we'll talk about this more when you talk about pain management and more on the NSAIDs, but there's some issues when you only focus on one version of that. If you only focus on the inducible form, it causes heart attacks as it turns out. We need to take them off the market, which is not really great. But anyway, right now we're just talking about a non-selective COX inhibitor work on both COX-1 and 2. Okay, as I mentioned, due to the fact that the NSAIDs as a group are going to be reversible inhibitors, you're going to find that the antiplatelet effect is going to be much shorter lived. So with aspirin, it lasts 7 to 10 days. Something like ibuprofen, something like naproxen, much shorter, maybe 24 hours, maybe 48 hours as soon as the drug is out of the system. That cox that's in the uh, the platelets is going to be able to work again, and thus it can cause the platelet aggregation. Okay, so that's really the big differences here. But certainly, if you give a patient if they're on chronic NSAIDs, there is that bleeding risk. As long as the drug is around, you're going to see the antiplatelet effects. Okay. Okay. You mentioned the, the GI effects of dyspepsia, the GERD, peptic ulcer disease. Again, you got to be really careful about that, especially if anyone has a history of that previously, or if maybe they have a concomitant H. pylori infection, something like that could be a risk. And bleeding, uh, GI bleeding is going to be one of the biggest things we worry about there. Um, and so how would you know if you had a, a peptic ulcer that was starting to bleed? There's some signs you could see there. Lactary stool can be indicative of upper GI bleed. What else? Like, you know, they have hematemesis or like a coffee ground emesis, right? That could all be signs of a uh, peptic bleed, right? So those are things you want to be watching out for. Um, give warning signs, not likely to occur with 81 milligrams of aspirin, but you could see that occur if you had multiple anticoagulants or antiplatelet drugs on board. These are all things you want to be considered. Uh, Okay, so then moving on, next we have our ADP receptor blockers, right? So he's blocking adenosine diphosphate here. And there's two main receptors you're going to find that work together. is P2Y1 and P2Y12. Mainly you're going to find that the, our drugs are working against the P2Y12 receptors here. And basically what they're going to do is they inhibit the cyclic AMP-induced 
inhibition of uh, platelet activation. So normally cyclic AMP would help to uh, cause platelet activation to occur there. Remember cyclic AMP is a, a kind of a category that fit under something we talked about previously. Yeah, it's one of the secondary messenger systems. So again, um, just a different pathway to get the platelets activated by inhibiting this. If you stop the P2Y12 receptor from being activated, you're going to find that this will help to prevent these platelets from aggregating together. Now, would it make sense to say combine patients um, taking an ADP receptor blocker plus aspirin? Did you get any additional benefit, you think? You would actually. Remember we talked about combining antibiotics together? What was the thing you wanted to remember when combining them? different mechanisms, right? The same thing can be said for antiplatelet drugs and anticoagulants is by using two different mechanisms, you get better efficacy than either one of them alone. So you'll find patients who will be on an ADP receptor blocker and aspirin, right? If they're especially at high risk for uh, having a clot uh, or say, for instance, they have a, a stent being placed into a coronary vessel to keep it open. Those are usually metal. And so metal likes to bind to platelets pretty easily. You have to give extra antiplatelet drugs to prevent that from occurring and blocking off that stent, right? So things to think about. Um, again, so these are going to be very important for helping to um, prevent the platelets from being activated. Um, they also interfere with some of that binding with the von Willebrand factor. So it kind of helps the platelets from binding to the actual vessel itself to kind of initiate that platelet plug formation. So a couple of different drugs in this category here. Teclopidine, we're not going to talk too much about because it actually has some pretty nasty side effects with it. Um, but certainly the three big ones you're going to run into include clopidogrel which is Plavix. Most people have probably heard of this one. Kind of had um, a lot of the market share for a good long period of time. Had a lot of marketing behind it. There is also Ticagrelor, which is Brylinta, and then Prasugrel, which is Effiant. Those are your three main ADP receptor blockers we're going to be talking about here. Um, again, you're going to find that depending on the dose that we're giving, you're going to see um, you know different amounts of platelet inhibition. So that may be why you adjust the dose based on how much kind of how an intensive effect you're looking for. And for a lot of these, you end up seeing that it takes couple of days before you really start to see maximal effects or eight to 11 days. And so very frequently, how do you think we could get around that delay in onset of action? Yeah, I can give a loading dose early, right? So you might find a lot of patients who are going to say the cath lab after an MI, um, they will actually give a loading dose of one of these drugs here, something like, you know, Plavix or, or uh, Brylinta, with a loading dose to kind of get them up to steady state initially and get that immediate antiplatelet effect. Because, right? again, they're going immediately to get something done about that. You don't want those platelets to clog up that vessel after you just cleaned it out, right? Now, other things we might use it for include preventing stroke, MI, um, you know, peripheral artery disease, they have angioplasty to help to prevent those clots from forming in there. And, again, this is synergistic with aspirin. So depending on the patient, you may need to combine the two together. However, what's the risk if you combine those two together? You see more bleeding potentially, right? Bruising, bleeding, et cetera, right? Um, so those are things you want to be uh, watchful for if you have to combine those two together. So as I mentioned, teclopidine, which is a prodrug. What's a prodrug mean? Yeah, it has to be activated usually in the liver. So these are mainly going to be oral agents. Sorry, aspirin's oral. These ADP receptor blockers are going to be oral agents we're talking about here. And basically, uh, this one was okay, but the, one of the big problems it caused was something called thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. What do you think that means? Yeah, it ends up seeing purpura form because it's actually stimulating platelet activation, right? So you get thrombocytopenic because they're all being taken up and getting causing all this purpura to form over the skin, right, uh, or in the skin. And so it's actually an immune-related reaction. You're going to see with a couple of these agents uh, today that you can have these immune reactions that actually overstimulate platelets. It actually causes thrombocytopenia because if they're all busy stuck in a plug somewhere, they can't really be measured in the blood. So it sounds kind of counterintuitive that you're stimulating platelets, yet you're getting thrombocytopenic. But kind of think about it like that. They're just all busy, essentially, to be measured. Um, so the risk here was a little too high and actually caused, you know, up to 50% mortality. Well, 60% mortality if it was not caught and managed early. So because of that, even though it was relatively rare that it occurred, it was still a little bit too high of a risk. And not only that, but you also ended up seeing, you know, uh, the bleeding risk kind of balancing that out just really wasn't that great. So we kind of got rid of that and not really using it quite so much anymore. However, we found that the risk was much lower some of the newer drugs we have here. So, for instance, clopidogrel is another pro-drug. Again, we're going to be seeing that uh, by giving it with a loading dose, you get the steady state much faster. You get antiplatelet actions much quicker. And here you still see the hemorrhage is going to be a risk here. The TTP risk is much, much lower, right? How would you explain to a patient you have a 0.00035% chance for this happening? It's kind of hard. To, yeah extremely low. And someone might be, well, how low? And you say, well, it's actually 0.00035. You know, 
most people don't need to know that. But um, again, this is something you want to be at least considerate of. If you do have a patient who's on it long term, they start to see a little purple forming, that could be a really bad sign, all right? So it's rare, but it can still happen. Um, again, so from a side effect profile, it's a little bit nicer, and that's why we saw Plavix getting a lot of use there for, for a period of time. Um, Prostagrel, though, and uh, Dicagrel, which we're going to see here in a second, they actually have an even higher affinity for blocking the platelet activation. So they're even better in terms of preventing the platelets from forming. But also, what do you think it does to the side effects? More likely to see bleeding, right? So again, it's kind of a double-edged sword there where you're saying, okay, again, swords can also cause bleeding as it turns out, whether they're one-sided or two. But um, you're going to find that by having a much stronger antiplatelet effect, you're going to find more bleeding risk. But sometimes that's okay, right? Sometimes you have to uh, balance that out a little bit. Um, some other kind of ancillary things here, you can see some increase in blood pressure. Now, why do you think this is clinically relevant? Yeah, you're using this for a lot of cardiac patients, and guess what they probably have preceding their cardiac event? Probably a lot of hypertension, right? So again, if it's not under well, uh, not well controlled beforehand, you may find you can actually exacerbate that hypertension. So one thing to note there, hyperlipidemia as well. You know, again, probably another thing that's kind of leading up to whatever cardiac event these patients are having. So again, something to at least be watchful for, monitor their, their lipid levels, and we'll talk all about lipids in the next section coming up. Uh, tech Agrilor, basically the same thing here. You're going to see um, better platelet inhibition, more bleeding risk. Um, this one's interesting. You can actually see increase in uric acid. What do you think this, or what kind of patients might this be a problem in? Yeah, if they have a history of gout, right, or if they have renal insufficiency, things like that, they can definitely see increased uric acid levels, and that can be a problem, okay? Okay, then up next we have our 2B3A receptor blockers. And so the first one we have here is abciximab. Now, have we covered any drugs yet at the end with MAB? Have I talked about MABs? What that means? Monoclonal antibody. What does that mean? Yeah, basically, it's, they're kind of custom tailored antibodies towards a specific target, right? Um, so, as an example, we uh, the old school way to do this, and we still do this for some drugs, would be, for instance, like snake antivenom, right? If I wanted to make uh, a drug that was very an antibody is very specific to bind to snake venom, I could then give to people. I can then inject small amounts of venom into sheep, actually, and then pull that out, isolate it, and then give that to people, and then boom, you have your antivenom, right? Poor sheep, but they survive. They have pretty good, happy lives in the research labs. But um, there are newer ways we can do that, right? There are going to be more sort of uh, uh, expensive ways we can do this. Um, a lot of these new drugs coming out nowadays, especially for things like rheumatologic conditions, tend to be monoclonal antibodies. There's going to be a couple of things I want you to know about this as a general class of drugs here. Um, when I say antibodies, does that mean that they're like, are they carbohydrate or a fat or a protein? They're protein, right? So some things to know about proteins. Uh, do you think this would be orally bioavailable? Mm -mm, no. So any monoclonal antibody you see, and they always have MAB at the end of the name, it cannot be given orally. They're generally going to be given either subcutaneously, if they're meant for home use, or they're going to be given IV, okay? Because they don't have any oral bioavailability. Uh, your stomach will chew up those proteins just like any other protein from a hamburger or something else. Just like that, right? Other things to know, does your body like it when you inject it with foreign proteins? <laughs> Generally, no, right? So what's the risk there? Anaphylaxis, right? You can see potentially you can develop antibodies that actually can neutralize the drug, right? Or potentially you can develop antibodies that can lead to anaphylaxis actually occurring, okay? So again, this is why sometimes you want to ask, okay, well, has the patient received this drug before? Because they could be at risk for developing these hypersensitivities, right? And again, either the drug may not work very well, or it could actually lead to anaphylaxis. And so if you had a patient going to the cath lab, do you want to have to deal with the anaphylaxis on top of the MI they're experiencing? Generally, no. That's usually going to be complicating factors. If you can avoid that, it's always going to be beneficial, okay? So anyway, anytime you see MAB at the end of a name, just know it's going to be a monoclonal antibody. There's actually a little bit more to know in terms of like some of the other prefixes. So if you ever see like XI, that actually means that it's a chimeric protein. It's actually part mouse and part human. So if you give this to your patients and all of a sudden they want cheese all of a sudden, just indulge them. It's okay. It's temporary. So I'm just kidding. You don't need that. But um, point being is though, is that the more foreign the protein is, the less humid it is, actually the more likely they are to see uh, risk of anaphylactic reactions, right? Because your body uh, is not used to having a lot. Anyone know, like, kind of what the, um, uh, you know, if I say, for instance, if I say sheep proteins, I'll say ovine. Anyone know what it is for mouse? Mm 
kind of that, that prefix, not prefix, I guess like the descriptive name is murine, right? Murine means mouse essentially, right? Um, what about horse? You know, if you had horse antibodies? Equine, yeah, exactly. So again, we have little names for these. At least you know the the uh, the origins of them, I should say. So anytime you have more murine protein, in there, you're more likely to see these anaphylactic reactions develop. Anyway, long story short, this is one of those drugs, right? But I want you to know that anytime you see one of these drugs, also, what do you think the cost is for this compared to something like, say, for instance, aspirin? Huge. These are going to be very, very expensive in comparison. So just note that. Okay, so anyway, getting on to it. And actually, whenever I, of course, I go right back to another tangent. Uh, I don't know if any of you do, any of you watch much TV? Exactly. Not anymore, right? So whenever I go to my, I don't either, but whenever I go to my parents' house, they always have the TV on, generally on uh, either Animal Planet or Food Network or, unfortunately, Fox News sometimes is what it is. <laughs> However, uh, what's funny, though, is all the drug commercials that come on, and nine times out of ten, it's actually going to be one of these monoclonal antibodies. So this is becoming a very pervasive group of drugs you're going to be running into, and so it's good to know at least a little bit of something about them. So if you ever look at that generic name, you see MAB, you know exactly what it is, essentially. Okay? Anyway, so this one specifically is going to be targeting that 2B3A receptor, right? So it's trying to prevent that cross-linking from occurring because of this antibody is bound up to that receptor and prevents fibrinogen from cross-linking those. The platelets can't form the plug, essentially. And again, these can be given with other agents to try to prevent that restenosis from occurring, right? So you can give it along with aspirin and maybe something like heparin that prevents stenosis from occurring in, in those patients there. So we're going to see that it works very well, works very quickly to bind up those antibodies, or the antibodies will then bind up those receptors there. And it usually stays bound about 18, 24 hours, and then they'll eventually will de get degraded away, just like other proteins will in the bloodstream, right? Anyway, so you typically see this with angioplasty probably most commonly. Anyway, biggest risk with these drugs is what? bleeding, right? So again, you're always going to see that there's going to be a uh, possibility there. And as I mentioned, with repeated use, you could see that sort of um, uh, this immunogenic sort of effect that you can see with that. Again, hopefully your patient doesn't need to get this a second time. But again, you know, sometimes you have those repeat customers coming in for the third, fourth, fifth heart attack. You guys ever watch that um, the SNL skit, the super fans? Yeah, they're all from Chicago. No, the, uh, Chris Farley's on one of them. And it basically has like a heart attack all the time. They say, oh, how many heart attacks is that for you? He's like, oh, it makes it a baker's dozen. He gives himself chest thumps and comes out of the heart attack. Anyway, you should look up the super fans. Very good. But that's a big risk, right? We have a couple other 2B3A receptor blockers here. We have things like aptifibatide, which is integralin. Now, note here, this is not an antibody. Even though it does the same thing, you're going to find it doesn't carry the same immunogenic, uh, immunogen, immunogenic risk as we saw with abcixumab. But it's still going to do the same thing by binding that 2B3A. It's much smaller molecule, so it's harder for you to have an actual reaction to it, even though it is a peptide. Again, same sort of uses as you're going to see with abcixumab. Uh, again, bleeding is going to be the bi biggest risk, but less immunogenicity. Okay. And then tyrofiban or agrostat is going to be the last one here. Now, this is actually a non-peptide inhibitor, so there'll be even less risk of immunogenicity with this one. However, this one is renally eliminated, so you would want to watch renal function, right? Because again, if you had a patient with poor renal function, what do you think would happen to the risk of bleeding? But increase, right? Because you have more of that drug sticking around, essentially. Okay, so we'll see some bleeding with this one, 10 to 12 percent. Which I mean, that's like one in 10 patients is going to have some bleeding. So again, you got to be watchful for that because that's a lot of patients you might be dealing with. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, so does that imply that the rest of these are hepatically eliminated? To some degree, right? So um, you'll find that some antibodies can be renally eliminated, um, but for the most part, they'll undergo that meta uh, hepatic metabolism for the most part. Yeah, uh, it'll just be less clinically relevant to have renal insufficiency. So for instance, you might make a choice between abcixumab or tyrofiban, depending on what the organ function is like, right? Yeah. Does that square with you? Yep. You look like you had like something like in the back of your mind, like yep. what to say, okay. Anywho, um, right, but that's basically what you're gonna see is that frequently the hospital may have like one or two of these on formula and you may have to make a decision, okay, well, what's the patient gotten previously? What's their organ function like? What should they get now, right? Okay, so those are the big antiplatelet drugs we're going to be running into. So the ADP receptor blockers, we have aspirin, we have the 2B3A inhibitors, okay? And again, knowing which combinations would make sense, right? So if I said aspirin, what else could I put it with that would be a good combo? Gubsixamab would be a good one. Clopidogrel would be a good one. Uh, would clopidogrel and, say, prasugrel be a good combo? It's going to be the same mechanism, right? So you don't see any additional benefit from that. So that's not going to be a good combo there. Um, so again, think about what makes for good synergies between medications. Okay. Let's see what time it is.
So um, let's go, go a few more minutes, and then I'll let you go on a break since we got started late anyway. But uh, getting into the anticoagulants. So specifically, these are going to be working on the clotting cascade, right? So again, you've seen this. You probably memorized it to some degree, correct? I post these online. You can you know, take a picture. Right now, if you oh, want. yeah, it's just mine doesn't show up. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, no it's not your fault. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, all right, so the big difference is here we have the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways, and then they all finally culminate into the common pathway, right? And again, I'm not going to have you memorize the entire pathways on here. I just want you to know which drugs are going to be affecting which pathways and kind of what general sort of factors are involved with that, and then how we monitor for the, the activity of those pathways. So in Clin Lab, you probably talked about, say, for instance, like what's the main clotting parameter you look at for, say, activity of the extrinsic system? I heard it. Say it louder. PT, right? PT is good for monitoring that, right? I heard something. I heard PT, and I just went with that, right? Um, <laughs> but for the intrinsic pathway, APTT, -T -T, right? Now, when you think INR, you always want to think about that being related to PT. So PT, INR are linked together. Talk about how that what that relationship is in a little bit, and then APTT is going to be for the intrinsic fact uh, system there. Okay, notice here they're both going to lead up and lead to common uh, activation of the uh, factor 10, and then that will eventually lead to factor 2 being activated here. Okay, 10 and 2 are super important because these are going to be involved with the common pathway. And in fact, what do you think if you had to choose one clotting factor to inhibit here to have the biggest effect? Which one do you think it would be? Either 10 or Two, right? So again, just think about when you're driving. Everyone probably drives very safely and doesn't have like their phone in their hand or you know applying makeup or anything like that. Always ten and two, right? So think about that being very important in terms of clotting factors here. Okay. Anywho, I'm not saying any of you would ever do that, but you see lots of crazy drivers out there, right? And so, yes. Anywho, a lot, a lot of international drivers, as it turns out, and some of them don't know our laws all that too well, as it turns out. I will tell you, however, though, one time I was an international driver. This is not a humble brag, but I was in Ireland one time, and they drive on the opposite side of the road, which was very intimidating, uh, and I seriously went the wrong way on a roundabout and uh, nearly got myself into some big trouble. So, um, yeah, just FYI. Ireland, driving the other side. Uh, anywho, so getting into this, we're going to see also that there are a lot of anticoagulants that are very useful in this process, because if you let the intrinsic or the extrinsic pathway kind of run rampant, what's going to happen? You're going to clot up everywhere, right? You can have something like a disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, right? You just clot everything off, essentially. Well, we need some things in order to prevent that from occurring, right? So you have things like antithrombin-3, which are going to be really important. Which uh, mediator do we talk about helps antithrombin-3 work better? Heparin, Heparin right? Heparin is going to be a big one we're going to talk about here. See how it's going to be affecting things like 11, 9, 10, and 2, right? That's important. Uh, we have things like protein C and S, which are going to have some anticoagulant effects, thrombomodulin. We'll talk about all these as they become important because some of our medications will work directly uh, to either inhibit these or to promote the activity of these agents. So starting off with heparin, we're going to find that heparin is basically this big sort of sugar peptide sort of amalgamation, right? It's a very long sort of molecule there. It's quite heavy. If you look uh, at the average weight, it can range anywhere between 3,000 to 30,000 Daltons, which means it's quite large, right? Um, so because of that, you're going to find uh, certain things uh, in terms of its elimination. Um, you're going to find this is going to be a little bit more based off of hepatic elimination because big molecules like that, do you think they're able to get filtered by the kidneys very well? No, but that's important because actually what we can do is we can kind of chop this up into smaller bits and we'll find some medications that fall into that category that do get renally eliminated because they are smaller and they can fit through that glomerulus to be filtered out through the, through the urine there. But anyway, and again, this is a product that people naturally produce anyway. Does anyone know what some of the, the, the original sources where we got our heparin from? It's actually beef and pigs. Right, so if you see bovine or what's the, the name for pigs? Porcine, yeah, porcine, right? So if you ever see porcine or bovine, that usually means it's an animal-based product. And so we said, well, you know, pigs are kind of like people sometimes, <laughs> more or less than some people. Um, but we actually were able to harvest heparin out of them and administer it to the patients, right? Nowadays, we have better ways to do it. We have more recombinant ways to form the heparin, so we don't have to worry about that quite so much. But uh, it's just interesting some of the original sources for these medications that we, we used to use. Same thing for like insulin. We used to get insulin from some of our uh, mammalian cousins out there in, in the uh, in the uh, livestock world. Uh, but nowadays, we don't need to because we have better ways to actually produce some of this stuff. But who might that be important to know if you're dealing with like a bovine product or porcine product? Yeah. 
Yeah, certain religious considerations, right? It can be really important to consider, okay, well, there's certain medication I can't even give this person because of their religious concerns. You want to be aware of that, right? So anyway, how is, un and, and here we're going to talk about heparin, the kind of the more general term is going to be unfractionated heparin. So because there's an unfractionated heparin, it stands to reason there's also a what? Fractionated. A fractionated form, right? We'll talk about the fractionated form a little bit later, and that's what I meant when I said chopping up that molecule into shorter bits. We'll find how that alters the activity of it to a pretty big degree here. Anyway, we saw that we're going to see heparin works with antithrombin-3 to increase the activity, and you're going to see the, the two main factors it's going to inhibit is going to be factor 2 and 10, but importantly for the intrinsic pathway, it's also going to be affecting 9, 11, and 12. So again, these are good numbers to know for these individual agents here is which drugs affect which clotting factors. So 2, 10, 9, 11, and 12. I only separate 2 and 10 because they're part of that common pathway, and then that way you know 9, 11, and 12 are going to be more for uh, the intrinsic pathway, okay? Anyway, so it kind of provides, uh, it kind of provides this nice platform for antithrombin-3 to work with. I'll show you a picture of what that kind of looks like in a moment, but it increases the activity. It's going to inactivate those factors much more quickly, okay? And then once it un unbinds to it, it can go bind to another molecule of antithrombin-3 and do the whole process over again, okay? So looking at this, here's a molecule of unfractionated heparin. Imagine it's one big long chain. Here's antithrombin 3, and then you're going to find that it can either bind to factor 10 or 2 in this case here. Remember, we also said 9, 11, and 12. Um, but here, these are the two main ones we're going to be focusing on. And you can see it just provides that platform. It allows antithrombin 3 to work that much better, inactivates it, these things from the antithrombin 3, and goes and in, uh, interacts with another one to do the same thing over again. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, it used to be extracted from porcine intestinal mucosa or bovine lung. For whatever reason, those tissues tend to be the, have the highest yield uh, for that stuff. Um, and so since then, we've been able to form it either, either using um, certain harvested cells. You may have, uh, sometimes for whatever reason, you'll see this come up every once in a while. It'll say it's like um, obtained from Chinese hamster ovary cells. Super specific, but for whatever reason... These Chinese hamster ovary cells are able to engineer to basically produce the products you're talking about. In this case, like heparin can, can be one of those. There'll be some other drugs we'll talk about later on. Um, but what you're going to see is that um, because it's such a large molecule, what do you think it, it means for its bioavailability? Not great. Remember, we talked about vancomycin being a really big molecule, and that couldn't be absorbed orally. This is kind of the same thing with heparin. So this is going to be a product that has to either be given IV or sub-Q, most commonly. Now, again, if you had to have a patient take this home with them, and administer it themselves, which route do you think they'd be giving it? Sub-Q, right? You wouldn't want patients starting up their own IVs and administering that. That could be a recipe for some big problems. Like what? Anyone know? So they could have infections. They can have trauma to the tissue. They can have... Because, again, what is this drug doing? It's anticoagulant. They have a nice IV line that's, that's sitting there. You can see bleeding along with it too, right? Um, so typically, patients are not going to go home. Sometimes when we have like an implanted port and things like that, but typically they're not going to be accessing themselves under less than very uh, rare circumstances. But more frequently, patients can give themselves subcutaneous medications. It's actually pretty easy to do uh, for them to train them up how to drop the medication and administer. So that is done occasionally. Um, which way do you think it's faster in terms of onset, IV or sub-Q? IV always, right? So again, you can get very fast onset by giving this IV. Um, and now the other nice thing about this as well, because it is such a big molecule, it doesn't cross the placenta or the blood-brain barrier. And so in this case here, it actually might be the preferred anticoagulant agent for women who are pregnant. Okay. Now, are women who are pregnant at risk for clotting? 100%. Anyone know why? It's all the estrogen they're producing, right? They're producing so much more in terms of hormones of estrogen. Guess what estrogen does in the liver? stimulates clotting factor production, right? That's where most of your clotting factors are made in the liver there. And so by stimulating that, you can see they're hypercoagulable. Also, what happens with the blood volume in pregnant women? It goes up and it gets a lot more kind of sludgy in some regard. It gets a little bit more viscous. And so it leads to these places of stasis where you end up seeing clotting actually happen there. So one thing to kind of consider about your patient population, okay? Anyway, um, there's going to be this dose-dependent half-life here, and in some patients it's going to be uh, extended if they have uh, very severe cirrhosis where their liver function is not great, or in renal failure can be a little bit more prolonged. Um, the renal failure issue is going to be bigger for some of the later ones we're going to talk about. This one really undergoes pretty minimal renal elimination for the most part, at least while it's still in its kind of active form there. Now, in terms of monitoring parameters, this is really important things to know for anticoagulants. So for an anticoagulant, you need to know what factors it's working with, you need to know what kind of monitoring parameters are used for it. And if there's a reversal agent available, you need to know what that is. Okay. 
a patient walks into your ER and they have a massive head bleed going on, you need to know how to fix it immediately, right? That is a yes, you should fix that immediately if you can, right? Um, anyway, so looking at this, you're going to find that because this is more affecting the intrinsic and the common pathway, that APTT is going to be the preferred monitoring parameter for this. I'm going to put a little asterisk there because there's going to be another monitoring parameter we'll talk about later that is now becoming a little more common. But for now, for our purposes, and traditionally, APTT has been the thing used to monitor the effect of heparin. And normally what you're shooting for when you're dosing this is going to be a ratio, right? Now, you can find what normal APTT values are. I'm not going to have you memorize those. But normally, you're going to be shooting for a ratio of around 1.5 to 2.5 times longer. Because, again, you measure APTT in terms of seconds, right? That's how long it takes for the blood to clot. You want this to be longer, showing that the, the clotting factors are not working as well. Okay. Now, when might we use this? Well, we can either use this for venous thrombosis. We can use this for pulmonary embolism that maybe happens secondary to a venous thrombosis. MI, angioplasty. We can use this for prevention. Or we could use this for active treatment of a clot, right? So if, like, someone goes on, say, an intercontinental flight and they're morbidly obese and they're going to be sitting in a plane for, like, 16 hours straight, this is the kind of patient where you may want to give prophylactic heparin to to make sure that they don't have a clot, right? They don't walk off the plane having one big swollen leg and they say, oh, better go to the ER is my first, first tourist attraction, right? Don't want that to happen. So, again, this can be very useful in terms of, of uh, prophylaxis and treatment. Now, which way do you think, uh, which dosing do you think is more intensive in terms of how much you have to give, either treatment or prophylaxis? Oops. Treatment generally, right? So you have to give a lot more of the drug because you're actively treating an uh, already formed clot versus if you're dealing with a clot that is yet to form, right? You usually give much smaller doses there. Just as an example, if I was giving heparin to treat an active clot, I would have to give it by a continuous IV infusion versus if it's something where I'm trying to prophylax a patient, say I have an ICU patient who is intubated and sedated and they're laid up for, say, weeks on end. That is someone who I'm also concerned about getting a, a venous clot. I can give them, say, subcutaneous heparin maybe every eight hours, much less intensive in terms of a dosing regimen. That makes sense? Okay. In terms of toxicity, obviously the biggest one is going to be Bleeding, right? Makes sense. Um, this is notable here that this is reversed with a drug called protamine sulfate. Okay, so again, big big stars here. Note the reversal agents. Um, protamine sulfate is going to be the agent to help reverse the effects of heparin because it will bind to the heparin and inactivate it essentially. Okay. There's a lot of dosing strategies associated with when the last time the heparin was given and how long it's been and all those sorts of things. But just know that protamine is going to be the reversal agent. So I might give you, say, hey, patient, um, you know, nurse accidentally gave too much of heparin. You want to know what drug to administer next. If the patient is having some, you know, their gums are bleeding or they have some blood in the stool, what do you want to do? You need to know that protamine sulfate is going to be the, the antidote of choice, okay? And then this is the other big thing is going to be this immune-mediated reaction called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, otherwise known as HIT, okay? HIT is a fairly rare thing, and it is going to occur sort of in a patient who's going to be getting this for uh, long term. And when I say long term, I mean usually like, say, five to ten days or so is when you're going to start to pick up on this. And essentially what your body is doing is it forms an uh, antibody against the complex of heparin and this product called platelet factor 4 that your body naturally produces. When those two bind together, your body makes an antibody against that, and then that actually stimulates platelet activation. Okay, so it stimulates all these platelets to start to aggregate, and so you'll notice that the platelets aren't being measured in the blood anymore because they're kind of busy being stuck in the clot somewhere. So that's why I call it heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, but it's actually causing clots to occur, which you can actually be fighting yourself because heparin is normally used to prevent clots, and now you're actually forming it. Okay. Anyway, um, what do we do if we have this develop? And again, how you normally notice this by you know you're measuring say daily CBCs in a patient, all of a sudden you see like a 50% drop in their platelets. That's pretty indicative of hit, right? Anyway, what you would do is you obviously want to discontinue the drug, try to get rid of that as quickly as possible, and then you actually need to give them an alternative anticoagulant, right? Because now they're in a really pro-coagulant sort of state because they're having this immune reaction. You want to give them something else. And so we're going to talk about a few direct thrombin inhibitors. That's the next class we'll talk about after we're done with the heparins. And so either leporudin or gotraban or denaparoid are the things we'll talk about then, okay? Typically, we're going to avoid our low molecular weight heparins, and we'll talk about those next, but it's kind of a, a, a smaller version of heparin that we'll use uh, clinically pretty often there. And we're not going to use warfarin. We'll talk about warfarin later until the thrombosis has resolved. Then you can reinitiate those if you need to. Okay. Okay. So any questions on that so far? So a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then continue talking about our anticoagulants. All right. All right. Any questions from the first half? There's no question specifically on the sticky board. There was a YouTube link, which I've not clicked on yet. And I fear to click on it in front of you guys because then you might see all my weird recommendations. But then I thought about it and I said, 
No, it'd actually probably be all my kids' recommendations because they watch YouTube on my account, which means there's like Peppa Pig all over <laughs> it and, and Blippi and all of that. So, um, anywho, now my kid sometimes will speak with a British accent because of Peppa Pig, which is <laughs> very funny because I come home and she's like, hello, daddy. And I'm just like, hi. <laughs> anywho, they're adorable. But, um,. Continuing on, so we talked about unfractionated heparin, which is kind of your standard original heparin your body produces. If you chop this up into smaller pieces, right, so for instance, if you have, say, one to 10,000 Daltons long of a chain there, now we get what we consider to be low molecular weight heparins, right? So if you ever see that, that's what we're basically referring to. Um, it has a little bit different activity. It has the same mechanism as regular heparin does, so you don't have to learn anything new from that regard. You do need to know, though, that it works on different clotting factors with a little bit of a different preference, as we'll see here in a moment. So the three main ones you're going to find are going to be anoxaparin, which I guarantee, I think, of all my clinical experiences, the only one I've ever seen used on formulary. Um, so it'll probably likely be the only one you're going to see used for the most part. But other ones out there include deltaparin and then tenzaparin. Okay, all work identical to one another with little differences in potency and whatnot. Anyway, what you're going to see the difference in activity is how it affects various clotting factors. You really lose a lot of the 9, 11, and 12 activity that unfractionated heparin has, and instead what you find is a bigger propensity to affect factor 10a. Right. With regular unfractionated heparin, you're going to find it's roughly a one-to-one -one activity, a ratio of activity between factor 2A and factor 10A. With low molecular weight heparins, you find there's a much higher emphasis placed on the anti-10A activity. Okay, so you're going to block more factor 10, less a, so a factor 2. This is important because you're going to find that if you, what monitoring parameter do we say we use for low or for unfractionated heparin? APTT, right, and that was measuring that intrinsic pathway, you're going to notice APTT is not very reliable for monitoring things like anoxaparin or lovinox. And because of that, we have to use a different monitoring parameter, which we'll mention in a moment here. And you can kind of visualize this in your mind as the low molecular weight heparins being a shorter chain length. You're going to see it doesn't really, you know, binds fine with factor 10A. There's no problem working with antithrombin 3, but it doesn't provide as good of a scaffold for factor 2. And so because of that, it doesn't work as well for that. It still has a little bit of activity, but not nearly as much, okay? Now, these are, again, too big to be given orally, so typically either sub-Q or we can also give it intravenously as the case may be. And actually the big benefit with using something like uh, anoxaparin is the fact that it actually required a lot less frequent dosing. It actually had a longer duration of action uh, than heparin does, uh, unfractionated heparin does. And so that for an active treatment of a clot, we can actually give this just twice a day instead of having to use like a continuous IV infusion. The, the downside of it, though, is it's not quite as titratable as you would see with heparin. So maybe for a patient who is, say, more at risk for, for bleeding, maybe heparin might be a better one to, to use just because you can monitor and titrate that a little better as a continuous infusion. This one kind of once the dose is given, then they're kind of just covered for that 12 hours there. So looking at this, you really see it has no good effect on APTT, so we don't use that to monitor it. And for most patients, unless they are at an extreme of age, saying they're small children or very old adults, as long as they're not morbidly obese, and I'm talking like, you know, say three, four, 500 pounds kind of obese, for the most part, you don't really need to do a lot of monitoring with this, which is a really big benefit. Instead of having to monitor APTTs constantly, you can just give it to your patient. For the most part, you just know they're anticoagulated, okay? Now, for some of those people, like I mentioned, like the extremes of age, and in fact, at Nemours, every single kid that we put on Lovinox will have monitoring done. We actually use an anti-factor 10A assay, and this is just specifically looking at the activity of factor 10A. It doesn't look at anything else. Remember, APTT was more looking at the intrinsic pathway. This is specifically at 10A, and in fact, what I was mentioning earlier with the the kind of the monitoring parameters for heparin and the, the big asterisk, here what we're saying is that um, this used to be a little bit more of an expensive, hard to come by assay. And so because of that, it wasn't done as frequently, but nowadays it's becoming a little bit more ubiquitous. You're kind of finding it everywhere. It's a little cheaper to run. Now, a lot of heparin protocols are actually starting to use anti a for monitoring rather than APTT. So it may be something you find when you're actually working out there clinically that um, using APTT is like something the dinosaurs used to do, and you don't do that anymore. So again, just, just something to know. Anyway, um, in terms of toxicity, you see less bleeding than heparin, which is great. And then also it may cause hit, but the risks are going to be a little bit lower than, than with heparin. Okay, Because against a shorter molecule, there's not as much for your body to actually develop an immune, uh, actual antibody against. Um, however, if a patient has a history of hit, do you think that we could use Lovinox for those patients? Yes. 
don't want to do that. There is cross sensitivities there. So a patient with a history of HIT, you do not want to give a low molecular weight heparin too. Okay. So to make it even more specific to the activities of factor 10, we have a very shortened molecule, and this is actually just a pentasaccharide sequence, so just five sugar molecules long here um, that works with antithrombin 3 just to affect factor 10A. So with heparin, it was kind of a smattering of different ones, 2, 10, 9, 11, and 12. With uh, low molecular weight heparins, it was mainly just 2 and 10, and now we see just factor 10. Okay, so the factor 10 inhibitor. And this is going to be Fonda Paranux or a Rickstra. And this is another one that has to be given subcutaneously, cannot, is not bioavailable orally. And this is nice because you could also use it for patients for either uh, prevention of clots, you could use it for treatment of clots, just like low molecular weight heparins was. But the nice thing here was is that it had such a low incidence of HIT that for a long time, before we had some of the newer agents, which we'll talk about later, if you had a patient with a history of HIT, you could actually give them Fonda Paranux and it was okay. You wouldn't want to give them low, low, low molecular weight heparins, but Fonda Paranox was just fine in those cases there, which is nice. And again, you can use it for a lot of cases. Um, any of you interested in orthopedics? Some of you might be using these drugs, especially like post-operatively, you know, they have a hip replaced, have a knee replaced. Um, you want to prevent clotting from occurring after performing that surgery. This is something you might put them on, right, in order to prevent that. Um, again, that might go the way of the dinosaur, so to speak, because you'll have some of these newer drugs, which we'll talk about later, but um, currently this is kind of what we're using these agents for, okay? Okay, next we have our direct thrombin inhibitor. So which factor are these going to be affecting? Factor 2 only, right? So again, with Vondaparinux, with low molecular weight heparins, you can use factor anti-10A factors to measure the activity here. This one, we're not really going to have a really good um, way to monitor. We're going to use APT, APTT to some degree, but it's not going to be as reliable as you would end up seeing with, um, say, something like uh, regular unfractionated heparin. But anyway, what we're going to be doing uh, is using something uh, that is based off the product called Hiridin. And you probably have already heard about this in, I think, your ENT guest lecture, perhaps. But Hiridin is actually a product that is formed in leeches. She was talking about leeches, I believe. What was the context they were using it? Okay. So then you start like building up blood in that area, and so then she had to like leech them. Mm-hmm. Patient got leached so to speak. Yeah, so occasionally we'll, we'll use me medical leeches, and I had, uh, someone asked me the other day about that, if I've ever seen them being used. And me personally, I've not seen them used, but I have kind of a funny story. Um, so who gets to handle the leeches? Yeah. Pharmacy for some odd reason. <laughs> I don't know what short stick we drew that said, here, <laughs> it kind of makes a drug. Why don't you hold on to it? And we're just like, great, we're stuck with the, the terrarium back here. Um, <laughs> And so uh, one of the hospitals up rotating at in school basically is like a little aquarium they had that they where they kept these medical leeches. Uh, and they're fairly expensive for what they uh, for for what they were because again there's like live animals and they're you know it's not just they go up to the swamp and pick some out I guess I guess I don't know where leeches normally live but um, they they were medicinally made or uh, engineered essentially. And so the problem was is that for one they stunk the high heavens so the whole place kind of stank like leeches which. Fortunately, I don't know what that smell is like. Um, the other thing was is that they like to escape. So you'd be walking along and see just like a little leech just kind of doing its thing, crawling along. So, yeah, gross, right? So that's in the pharmacy where all you're making your IV drugs that are going to be given to patients intravenously, right? Gross. Um, the other funny thing, though, not funny at the time, but um, the, the interesting thing that happened was is that um, one of the technicians there, they didn't know that the smell was like just normal for leeches, and so they assumed they had gone bad. And so what do you do with a fish that dies? Flush it down the toilet. So they did that with all these really expensive leeches. They were still very much alive. Uh, so presumably there's some colony up there in, in the Jacksonville sewer system of these leeches. So, again, that's my experience with leeches thus far. Someone have a question? No, okay. So anyway, so that, that was that. Hey, but I think the smarter thing that the pharmacists did, because they were probably sick of having to manage these leeches, they said, well, let's just make a drug that does the same thing and just get rid of the leech altogether, right? <laughs> Cut out the middle leech and just use the drug itself. So <laughs> this is where we have our direct thrombin inhibitors. And so basically um, we have leporudin, bivalirudin, and argotroban. And these are all three going to be used uh, to, and again, it depends on hospital formulary, which one they're going to be stocking for the most part, maybe one or two of these. Um, the big differences between these are going to be the fact that uh, they will undergo different eliminations. And so uh, with leporudin and bivalirudin, 
they'll undergo renal excretion. And so because of that, if you have a patient with renal dysfunction, it may not be the best drug. It's going to be a little bit more unpredictable. Now, these are going to be given via IV infusions. And so you're kind of monitoring the APTT, kind of getting to that uh, certain range that you're looking for, usually say one and a half, two and a half times baseline. Um, but if they have renal insufficiency, it may make it more difficult, in which case you could switch over and using something like Argotraban, which is more hepatically eliminated. And that way you kind of get around that. But if the patient has cirrhosis, then maybe that's not a good drug and you need to use something like leperudin instead. Um, the main place where I would see this being used, because uh, again, I, did, I don't have like an extensive work history with like cath labs and, and cardiac and things like that. However, what I would see this used for frequently was in the ICUs. If you had a patient who was on uh, heparin for a long period of time, they developed HIT, this would be the drugs you want to switch them over to, right? Because you put them in a state with a pro, uh, pro-thrombotic, and so you take them off the heparin, you put them on a direct thrombin inhibitor until they kind of got rid of all the clots, and then you could kind of figure out what to switch them to after that. Okay, so this is where I would see that very frequently. Okay, up next we have warfarin. So warfarin, in terms of the anticoagulants we've looked at, this is the first oral agent that we have now. So this is kind of the first oral anticoagulant, and it's been around for a very long time. And just another fun party trick that you can bust out to your friends, should you ever go to a party again, is actually warfarin is an acronym. Warfarin actually stands for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And so you'll tell that to your friends and they'll say, ooh, ah. No? Okay, well, anyway, tell them the leech story secondhand and they'll, they'll love it. But the way we found it was actually that these, uh, there was like kind of like spoiled plant matter that these like cows were eating. And they found these cows kind of like bleeding out or having these hemorrhages. And so they're just like, why, why are these cows having these bleeding issues? And they, they linked it back to this product called dicumarol. And then from there, they said, well, why don't we use it for other things? And so they actually used it as a rodenticide. And, then, and that means it kills what? kills rodents, right? So you use it for mice and rats and things like that. And so uh, one of the big things here is that most of the rat poisons you're going to see over there are still derivatives based off of warfarin, dicumarol, brodificum, things like that. If they see a C-O-U-M, that's usually going to be um, the same kind of classification uh, of chemicals here, of uh, anticoagulants. And so technically for a long time, we're just giving our patients rat poison on purpose to prevent them from having a clot, say after developing AFib or something like that. So anyway, so we were giving it to them, uh, and so uh, this is really important because we were using this for decades and decades, and it required a lot of monitoring. Uh, there's a lot of bleeding risk associated with it, and again, the problem, if you have too little warfarin for these patients, would be what? They'd get a clot, like I said, they'd develop a stroke after uh, getting a clot due to AFib, and they got too much, they bled out, right? So again, there's a very delicate balance here. And in fact, for a lot of pharmacists for, uh, for a while there, we ran basically the Coumadin clinic. So my first rotation, that's basically what I did for two months, was just run a Coumadin clinic. Patients would come in, I'd do a point of care INR test, we'd talk about their diet, talk about their dosing, uh, make an adjustment based off their range, and then we'll talk about the monitoring in a second. Uh, and then they'd come back again in another couple of weeks or a couple of months, depending on the case. Uh, and so we got a lot of work with this. Um, nowadays, um, we're actually using a newer class of drugs which we'll talk about at the end here, um, they're really kind of getting around a lot of that monitoring. And so it's much better from a uh, patient compliance standpoint, much better from them not having to come into a Coumadin clinic all the time, right? But anyway, very important drug to know about because you're still going to see a lot of patients who are on it. And some patients may not be good candidates for some of the newer agents that will still be on warfarin. So what does this do? Basically, this is going to be a vitamin K antagonist. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, basically, your liver normally will intake vitamin K from the GI tract. It will then use that vitamin K in this process to form new clotting factors, okay? Some of the big ones include like 2, 7, 9, and 10. Now, 2 and 10 we know from the common pathway. Where do we say factor 7 was, was involved in? That's part of the extrinsic pathway, right? So what do you think we need to do to monitor the effects of warfarin? PT and then INR is going to be the, the main thing we're going to be looking at there. So keep that in the back of your mind. So anyway, so basically what it does is it prevents this recycling of vitamin K. It prevents it and uh, actually inhibits this vitamin K epoxide reductase. It prevents it from being recycled. So thus your liver cannot form new clotting factors. Okay. So all the ones we looked at so far, the all the heparins, all the direct thrombin inhibitors, uh, Fonda Paranox, they all work specifically by blocking and inhibiting the activity of those already formed clotting factors. So the onset of action, was it pretty quick or pretty slow? This is working directly against the factors. Pretty quick, right? As soon as you start an IV infusion of heparin, you're going to be anticoagulated. How do you, long do you think this is going to take to kick in? It's going to take a lot longer, right? It's going to take days, potentially, before it really kicks in because all the clotting factors you already have circulating around, they're still going to do their thing. This is just preventing new ones from being produced. 
Okay, so that's the main difference in terms of onset of action. I'm talking about bridging a little bit later and trying to use two different anticoagulants at the same time, waiting for warfarin to kick in. Anyway, so 2, 7, 9, and 10 are the big ones. Also, protein C and S. And we actually know protein C specifically has some natural anticoagulant properties anyway, so that'll be important in a little bit. Um, anyone know the other name for vitamin K? Another name for it. Actually, phytonidione. You ever see that? We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's going to be really important to know. Um, actually, one patient, or not one patient, one student one time, uh, they said, oh, it's uh, potassium. <laughs> That's a close, but no cigar. Uh, cannot give my patients bananas for warfarin toxicity, unfortunately. It does not work. Um, but anywho, so again, this is uh, preventing this recycling process here. And so uh, what we're going to find is, is it does take some period of time for this to really kick in. This is another picture kind of showing the same thing. Um, one thing I do want to know is that there are two main enantiomers of warfarin. There's going to be the S warfarin and then the R warfarin. For our purposes, clinically, the S warfarin is much more significant in terms of its anticoagulant effect. But also, what do you notice about its metabolism? going to be through the SIP system, right? So you're going to see that things like CYP2C9 is going to be a major uh, enzyme that's responsible for metabolizing the S-warfarin, but also what you notice on this side here for the R-warfarin. 3A4 is another one that's on there. So you can see uh, what kind of drugs we've talked about previously that can maybe potentially affect warfarin metabolism. Bactrim is going to be a big one because that inhibits what enzyme? 2C9, good. What else? Macrolides. Anything else? Azole antifungals for sure. What else? Chloroquinolones, right? Because that inhibits what? 1A2. Why do you guys actually remember so much of this stuff? It's great. It didn't, didn't like just dump it out immediately uh, with drugs and alcohol after the test. That's good. It's fantastic. <laughs> Everyone copes differently, though. So I'm just saying. But very good. So remember, there's a ton of drug interactions that happen with warfarin, which, again, makes it more difficult. Because what happens when patients get older and they develop AFib and they always have their medical conditions? They're going to be on a lot of drugs, right? And so you're going to see a lot of interactions, and this made it very difficult to use warfarin for a lot of those patients, as it turns out. Um, one of my first patients I ever had uh, that I was doing um, warfarin monitoring for was this older gentleman who had hepatitis C, and he had uh, HIV. And a lot of the medications he was on, we're going to learn that a lot of HIV meds, we'll learn about this next semester, have strong inhibiting properties here uh, for some of these enzymes, or for some of these um, uh a specific SIP enzyme. So because of that, he was extremely difficult to get into range because um, once they changed his HIV regimen, guess what? It put his warfarin, uh, it needed a totally different warfarin dose, and we had to go back and monitor every week for a while until we got the right dose, and it was very cumbersome. So again, this can be really problematic, and which is why we will have a greater appreciation for the newer drugs, which we'll see in just a moment here. So again, warfarin, once we get therapeutic levels of that, that will inhibit the recycling of vitamin K. Then we're going to find that that will uh, lead to decreased clotting, fa <clears throat> excuse me, decreased clotting factor production, but it's going to be delayed, right? It's not going to allow for new clotting factors to be produced, but the ones that are already there are still going to do their thing. Okay, and looking at the half-lives here, it kind of makes sense why it takes several days for a lot of these clotting factors to kind of clear out of the system for warfarin to have its effect there. However, one thing I do want you to know is that protein C is an anticoagulant naturally, and it will be inhibited by, by the activities of warfarin as well. So what do you think would happen if I inhibited this one, got rid of this one first, because it's a short half-life, but it'll still take in two or three days before these really get uh, get eliminated? So I'm losing my anticoagulant, which will put me into a hypercoagulable state, right? So that's why you gotta be really careful when you first start a patient on warfarin, they may be at an increased risk for clot. So if they say someone was started, uh, someone just had a PE, and you wanted to put them on warfarin for a period of time to prevent subsequent PEs from occurring here, you got to make sure they have something else on board to prevent that clot from reoccurring. So this is what we call bridging therapy, where basically you'll have them on one anticoagulant for a period of time. You'll start up the warfarin. So you'll have two anticoagulants going at the same time. And then once the INR gets in range, then you can take them off the other anticoagulant. So you provide that overlap give the warfarin time to do its thing, and then take off that first anticoagulant. So most often this is done with heparin or anoxaparin. You would bridge them with that until the warfarin kicks in and then take it off. Does that make sense? Okay, so again, they're providing, so, uh, the one anticoagulant is providing support for heparin to prevent further clotting due to that lack of protein C there, okay? Okay, so as I mentioned, warfarin is given orally, which is great because most of the other anticoagulants we've looked at have all been IV so far, or sub-Q. And so very good oral absorption. You're going to see that uh, even though it has a long half-life, it'll take several days for it to really kick in and get to uh, an appropriate uh, you know, steady state level there. And then also it's highly protein-bound to albumin. So what would happen if I had a patient with, say, uh, hypoalbuminemia? 
What does that do to the free fraction of warfarin? It would actually increase, right? So what does that do to your anticoagulant effect? It's going to go up too, right? You're going to see they're more at risk for bleeding because of that. Or if I had another drug that came in and kicked warfarin off of the, the, the protein, that'll do the same thing, right? That free fractional increase, and you're more at risk for having a, a clot or having, having a bleed in those cases there. And you can be really, really careful with these uh, enzymes, like CYP2C9 is a big one with Bactrim. Uh, we talked about the macrolides being a big one for 3A4. Um, also, what did I mention about vitamin K absorption from the gut? It's responsible for a lot of that. The gut flora, right? So again, any antibiotic could potentially affect the vitamin K intake, and so that can affect your warfarin potentially. Okay, so little things to think about with these. Okay, now um, we mentioned like heparin is really good for pregnant patients because uh, it will not cross that blood-brain barrier, will not cross the placenta. More specifically, I should mention for for that. However, this one does cross the placenta. It's really fat soluble. And one of the things you'll you'll note for fetuses is that you never ever want to mess with your fat soluble vitamins. What are your fat soluble vitamins? A, D. E and K, right? So those are the four fat soluble ones. Um, never want to mess with those in the developing fetus. You can cause some very significant effects there. And so this one, messing with vitamin K, you don't want to do that. We'll talk about uh, anyone know which we use. Uh, what can interrupt vitamin A? It's really important for to prevent patients from getting pregnant. We'll talk about for for acne later on. So any of you are interested in derm? Yeah, you ever heard of Accutane? Yeah, we'll talk about that a lot later, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind if you're interested in derm. Some of you might be. We'll talk about that there. But um, anyway, so this is contraindicated in pregnancy. This would not be good. We'd rather send a patient home on sub-Q heparin than place them on warfarin just because we know that would have really deleterious effects with, for the fetus there. Okay. So drug interactions, things that will alter the activity. And so not only are the drug interactions, uh, drug drug interactions so huge, but the drug food interactions. So anything with high vitamin K intake or content, what would that do? to the anticoagulant effects of warfarin? Increase it or decrease it? Decrease it, why is that? So I'm absorbing more vitamin K. That vitamin K can be used at least once to form the new clotting factors. It can't be recycled, but it can be at least used at one time. And that would decrease the anticoagulant effect of warfarin, okay? What are foods with high vitamin K content? Collard greens. Greens in general, green leafy vegetables broadly, right? So all of your broccoli, your uh, collard greens, your endives, or your fancy patients shopping Whole Foods, um, your spinach, turnip greens, all that stuff is ha really high in vitamin K. Not only that, but also think about things like mayonnaise, right? Go to Publix to go get a pub sub. What's the first thing they do? Slap on that mayonnaise. That's going to affect your warfarin, right? You got to be careful with that sort of thing. <laughs> They're so ingrained, just to, like just kind of indicative of, like the culture around here is that like when if I ever go to get a pub sub, it is almost muscle memory for them to grab that little spatula and just slather on the mayonnaise. I'm like, I didn't ask for, I don't want that. No, <laughs> and waste a whole loaf of bread. It's not good. Anywho, um, right. So think about things like you know canola oil. Oils tend to be uh, you know because it's a fat soluble vitamin. It's going to partition into those fats, and so you can see high vitamin K content there, right? So this is why it was really difficult to keep INRs in range too, because I mentioned that Coumadin clinic I was working at. Uh, is my first rotation. Well, it was in Palaka, Florida, right? And I've mentioned being from Palaka, Florida, probably once or twice before. Um, anyone know the, uh, what Palaka is kind of like? It's kind of like the yeah, it's kind of like the Bible Belt a little bit. It's um, you know, you have a lot of like salt of the earth kind of people. You know, these are people that frequently like they grew their own food, right? So we'd have these patients that were growing their own spinach and collard greens. And my, my grandparents lived next door to us my whole life, and they in, the, in that same town, and they did the same thing, right? This is just kind of the culture of the people there, and that made their vitamin K intake very high. And so that meant that what do we have to do to the dose of warfarin we gave to those patients? You have to increase it as well, right, to account for that. But what happened if they say got transplanted somewhere else and they had no vitamin K intake? Then you got to go back and decrease the dose. So this is why you really see this kind of seesawing effect. We'd have to really adjust their, their warfarin and that they did not keep their diet very consistent. Consistency was the key here. You don't want to tell them to have no vitamin K because you still need vitamin K. You don't want to tell them to go overboard with it, but just keep it consistent. We'll adjust the dose of warfarin to the patient. Okay. The big thing to know with that. Um, other things, you know, things are going to increase the activity of warfarin are going to be the C2C9 inhibitors, as I mentioned. Any protein binding interactions you got to be really careful of. Um, and then, obviously, we mentioned the antibiotics decreasing the intake of vitamin K due to that in, uh, impaired gut flora there. Okay. Um, obviously, they have liver dysfunction. That can also impair their ability to make clotting factors and will make the warfarin work even better, as it turns out. Okay. So those are things you really want to be aware of. So how do we monitor warfarin? We talked about this using the PTINR, right? INR is basically 
Um, you know, depending on the lab you measure your PT at, it can be variable depending on the, the kit you're using and things like that. INR was developed to be kind of the, the, the international normalized ratio, so you could take that anywhere. And INR of two in here in Florida is going to be the same as it would be in Japan or Germany or any lab you go to. INR is basically um, uh, all normalized out for those, those kits. So as I mentioned, this is going to be more looking at the common and the extrinsic pathway here, which is why we use PT INR to measure those patients. And what's a normal INR for a healthy person? One, right? Because again, their INR over a normal INR. If it's both normal, then you see it's an INR of one. Um, what are we usually shooting for with patients we want to anticoagulate? Two to three. So for the majority of patients, two to three is the therapeutic range. Why might we shoot higher than that? Hmm? Actually, yeah, so if you have a mechanical valve replacement, why do you think they need a higher anticoagulant effect? More at risk for clots. So, yeah, so presumably they'd be more at risk for clots, but why are they more at risk for clots? It's like a foreign material, right? So, again, as I mentioned, just like those uh, those stents you can place in the coronary vessels that are bare metal, right, that can attract platelets to bind to them. The body doesn't like that, right? It wants to get rid of it. It wants to kind of clot over it. Um, that's why we give antiplatelet agents to those patients getting stents. Same thing here is you have a mechanical heart valve, you're going to want to form a clot against that. And so that's why we have to drive up the anticoagulant effect to prevent that. So if you had, say, something like a porcelain valve put in, not a big issue, right? You would still anticoagulate them just the same as someone else who had a normal valve. If they have a mechanical valve, though, that's where you have to jump up higher. And that we're, you'd shoot for two and a half to three and a half, okay? For the majority of patients, most patients AFib, two to three is, is uh, appropriate, okay? It's a good number to remember. And why is um, Eliquis contraindicated for the mechanical valve? Um, I don't know if I've seen a specific contraindication. I have to look that up. I know you have to use work for the valve. So that's why for I those, it's probably lack of <laughs> clinical studies, right? And so we'll talk about the NOACs or, uh, just a few moments here. Um, but frequently, if we, because warfarin's been around for decades and decades, right? We've been using this since, like, I don't know, the light bulb was invented practically. But, um, with the newer drugs, we may not have the clinical studies. And again, the number of patients you run across with mechanical heart valves is relatively small. And so it's hard to run studies and get the numbers needed to really show that it, it's probably as effective, but we just don't know, right? So it's one of those things when you run into problems. So as I mentioned, if they have a natural warfarin resistance or certain pharmacogenetic differences in these patients that make them more resistant, they may need a higher dose. Um, and looking at their different CYP2C9 alleles, you can find that some people are very slow metabolizers. What do you think that would do to the warfarin effect? It would actually increase, right? Because I'm not metabolizing as quickly, so the levels would build up, and thus I'd have more anticoagulant effect. Um, you can find this about 10 to 20% of white patients, right? A little less in black patients. But again, it's one of those things where there's a lot of differences in the dose that's required. I may have a white patient who only requires, say, 5 milligrams daily, whereas maybe I have like a black patient who requires, say, 12 milligrams daily. It just depends on what their individual pharmacogenetics are. If I go to, as I mentioned, like Palacca, Florida, where they may need 15 milligrams because they're eating collard greens and turnip greens all day long, whereas I go somewhere else where maybe they don't eat as much vitamin K and they may need less, right? So again, it's very, very interpatient uh, dependent uh, on diet and genetic factors. Okay, so what's the big risk? Bleeding. I, I've, obviously, bleeding is, is a big thing. If you keep it within the therapeutic range, it's relatively low risk for the most part. Um, as you start to get higher and higher INRs, say above four, above five, this is where you run into issues of having things like intracranial bleeds, and that can be a really uh, big potential issue here. I remember I had... Um, you know, just a, kind of a, a slide aside, um, you have to be really careful with mixing anticoagulants along with certain herbal supplements. And kind of a general rule of thumb, of, uh, thumb is any uh, herbal supplement that starts with a G typically has some anticoagulant effects, right? So like ginkgo biloba, ginseng, and things like that. I actually had one patient who was coming in who uh, was probably like late 70s who had a history of AFib, was on warfarin. And, you know, people, as they get older, what happens to their memory? It gets worse, right? Thank you for reminding me of that. I wasn't sure. Um, but she wanted to, uh, to take ginkgo because she thought it would help her, her memory out. And so she was taking warfarin along with the ginkgo. All of a sudden, she started having altered mental status, brought her in, did a CAT scan, and guess what? Huge head bleed. Huge. I mean, it's causing all kinds of midline shit. I mean, this is a huge bleed. It was so big that even, like, me as a pharmacist, I could look at it and be like, that's not right. That's... <laughs> No, that's bad. Um, and she, she died from that, right? Because of the fact that there's this interaction that they weren't aware of, right? And again, if the patient's self-medicating themselves with herbal supplements and they don't realize there's that interaction, no one asks the question, hey, what herbals do you take? That, that's going to be a big problem, right? So again, that can be uh, really, really significant. Anyway, so we talked about um, 
reversal agents, right? So we talked about protamine being good for heparin. Not really a whole lot. You find protamine may be somewhat effective for, for low molecular weight heparins, uh, but not nearly as effective. And that's kind of the only one we've talked about so far. But now we're getting into another antidote here. And so with warfarin being a vitamin K antagonist, what's going to be the reversal agent for that? You know, you have more vitamin K or phytonidione, right? So you should be able to, to um, point that out as being uh, another name for vitamin K. Anyway, so we're going to be giving this, um, depending on the INR, depending if they're having any significant bleeds already, that will dictate if we're giving a PO, if we're giving an IV, sub-Q potentially. So there's a lot of different ways we can administer this. Um, however, if a patient's having an active bleed, is giving a dose of vitamin K really going to be all that useful? Why not? It still takes time to produce those clotting factors. So there's a delay in activity. You still want to give it, but it's going to take some time to kick in. So what else could I do to fix the problem? That's where we get the fresh frozen plasma, right? Fresh frozen plasma has all the clotting factors already in there. So I administer that to the patient. That will then help to reverse the uh, the anticoagulant effects of warfarin. Now, could I give FFP to someone who had overdose, say, on uh, noxaparin? Couldn't. Why is that? The noxaparin just started to work on all those clotting factors I just put in the patient, right? So it's not really going to be all that effective there. However, this is one of those cases where FFP is one of the reversal agents for warfarin, that and vitamin K. So you do want to know um, to use both of those if you have any significant sort of bleed. It's so like a GI bleed, head bleed, anything like that. You want to go ahead and start both of those together, okay? Obviously, this is going to be triadogenic, so we don't want to use this in pregnant patients. And there's also, uh, for patients who have a protein C or S deficiency, you can actually see these little skin necroses um, that will pop up uh, occasionally there. So we needed some, some kind of alternative, right? Warfarin is such a bear to work with. And so we saw that, again, it's highly diet dependent. We saw there's such frequent monitoring having to come in every week for the first couple of weeks to get their PT INR in, in range. All the drug interactions. The one benefit, though, is really easily reversible. If I have a patient who comes in with a major bleed from warfarin, I can fix that. No problem, right? Doesn't mean there's not going to be complications, but uh, it's relatively easy to fix. Nowadays, we have some alternatives. And so these are some of the newer ones. And so if you ever hear the term NOAC, that means new oral anticoagulant, or if you're DOAC, that means direct oral anticoagulant. So those are two terms you might see for this new class here. But this is going to include dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and then apixaban. Okay. Now, dabigatran was the first one on the market here, and this was an actual oral direct thrombin inhibitor. So you kind of think about it as having the same mechanism as like leporudin and ergotraban. Uh, but dabigatran was really good because it inhibits uh, the formation of fibrinogen, which didn't have the feedback uh, uh, benefits of inhibiting uh, further activation of things like, you know, factors 5 and 8 and, and 11, uh, 13, all of that. So again, the big thing to just know is inhibiting factor 2 directly, okay? Um, you would use it for DVTs, use it for PEs, AFib, you could use it as an alternative to warfarin. A lot of really good things there. Um, however, there's no really good monitoring for it. So you couldn't use APTT, you couldn't use PTINR, there's nothing really you could use to monitor all that effectively here. But that was a benefit. You didn't have to have, have patients coming in all the time to have their, their levels checked. Um, now, the problem was, though, is that there was no good reversal agent for it. There's no good way to get rid of it or to reverse the effects because even if I gave FFP, you'd find that it would just inactivate that new thrombin that you were in, in putting into the patient there, right? So what did they do? Well, the same company that makes uh, the Bigotrain actually made this new antibody called Idarucizumab. You're going to find that a lot of the monoclonal antibodies are a severe mouthful. And I have to practice these every day to make sure I don't sound totally inept when I come talk to you. But idarucizumab, or Praxbind, much easier to say, um, is going to be an antibody that's been designed specifically against the bigotran. Okay? Problem is, though, if I go to a podium hospital in the middle of nowhere, they are less likely to carry this than they would have vitamin K on hand or FFP on hand. Right? So little things to think about. Again, you want to watch for patients with renal insufficiency because, again, this might be uh, more difficult to, for them to clear and they may see more bleeding effects. Uh, the next two we have here are going to be rivaroxaban and apixaban. These are both, instead of fact, uh, being direct thrombin inhibitors, these are both going to be factor 10A inhibitors. So think about rivaroxaban, apixaban being the same mechanism as fondaparinux, but these are the oral alternatives to these, okay? And so we're starting to see these being used for DVTs, AFib, all the same indications as you would for warfarin. And in fact, what's actually is kind of cool is that nowadays with these, we can uh, have a patient who comes into the ER, and we're doing studies on this now. Um, it's starting to become more common practice. But instead of having, you know, they come in with a, a massive PE, instead of putting them on a heparin drip or something, we can just actually give them a pill to take. And then all of a sudden they're anticoagulated. And so we're starting to see this more like apixaban and, and things like that, which is kind of uh, very nice from that standpoint.
But uh, again, no routine monitoring here is needed. And in terms of reversal, we don't have a lot of good agents here. There is a new one that's about to come out on the market. I think it's still in some of the late stage clinical trials. So I'll probably have to update this for next year. Um, but in terms of bleeding, there are certain compounds that we can um, we can purchase uh, and, and give in. So we have these things called PCCs. They're called prothrombin complex concentrates. These are very concentrated forms. Uh, prothrombin, which you know gets factor, turned into thrombin, factor two, and then several other clotting factors. And so we've found some benefits by using this to reverse some of the effects of the agents here. But again, very expensive and may not get full reversal effects. Okay. Again, apixaban is going to be used very similarly. The one big difference here is that it can be affected by P-glycoprotein and 3A4. And again, these are two things affected by grapefruit juice. You could find that uh, if I had a macrolide on board, if I give someone erythromycin, it could affect this. So again, really big things to watch out for here. There's also some other cardioactive agents we'll talk about later as well. They can inhibit 3A4. They can be really problematic. Okay. So that's it for the anticoagulant section. We finished a few minutes early. Just barely. Two minutes early. Oh, I should be so thankful for the time. I'm so generous with. Oh, but let me answer a few questions first. Uh, oh boy, just a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, I'm not going to click on these because I'd like to vet them beforehand. Uh, I don't want any Rick Rolls on my watch. <laughs> anyway, since some rat poisons contain warfarin, would uh, we see hemorrhage as a symptom of rat poison toxicity in humans? Uh, yes, actually we would. We worry about this with uh, little kids getting into it at, like, say, grandparents' house. Oftentimes we'll find, um, we'll get calls at the poison center where a kid has, has eaten one. And the thing is, is like, they say, what do I do? Do I take my kid to the hospital? Now, me working at the poison center, why I tell them to go to the hospital immediately? What do you think? Not usually, right? Because how long does the, the warfarin take to kick in? A couple of days, right? So I'd actually say, hey, why don't you go ahead and take them in two to three days? Obviously, if you see any bleeding, bruising in the meantime, yeah, take them in. But go in two or three days, go check with the P, uh, PCP and have an INR checked. And that's basically how we would manage that. If we see the INR is one, then they probably didn't get enough to be a problem. And if it's elevated, then what do we do? Give vitamin K, right? Good. If they have any uh, significant bleeding, I give them FFP if I need to, right? So those are things that we would consider that it works the same exact way. Um, okay, a study of patients with mechanical valves using dabigatran slash warfarin resulted in 5% of patients in the dabigatran group suffering a stroke. Also had increased serious bleeding compared to warfarin. No further studies have been done with other new drugs from up to date. There you go, right? So then again, uh, a lot of these things are going to be very indication specific. So again, here they're using it for uh, for stroke because again they're looking at mechanical heart valves. So that's good to know, right? So maybe the bigger train is not great, but who knows about a pixaban? Who knows about rivaroxaban? Maybe they're too gun shy to try it, right? You typically don't want to run a study if it's going to look like it's killing people because then it's not great for your market share, right? So who can say? But thank you for that good up to date piece of information, quite literally. Any other questions I can answer for you? I have a quick one. Yes. Um, that's a good question. It's still good to know, um, specifically because you're going to be seeing these drugs come up a lot anyway. So just because we're done talking about the macrolides, you may still see them come up. So if I mention them specifically, or if we talked about them here, then I think it's probably still fair game that I mentioned that sort of thing there. But is it going to be as big of a focus as it was on the last test? Probably not, but there might be a question about it, right? I can't say for sure. I've not written the test yet, so I, who could say besides me? And I will say later when I actually make it. Any other questions? If not, thank you. I'll see you guys next time.